very good afternoon and welcome to BBC News. More details have emerged about the arrest of Jamie Acourt, one of Britain's most wanted fugitives. He'd managed to evade detection for two years before being arrested in Barcelona on suspicion of drugs offences. Jamie Acourt was one of the five people suspected of being involved in the murder of Stephen Lawrence in 1993, something he's always denied. Spanish police sources say he used false identities. At the time of his arrest, he claimed to be an Italian tourist. James Waterhouse reports. Jamie Acourt, not looking too happy after his arrest, was on the list of the most wanted suspects living in Spain. Spanish police told the BBC he had protection and help, and even claimed he was an Italian tourist during his arrest. He was captured by armed officers from the Spanish National Police as he left this gym near the Sagrada Familia Cathedral in Barcelona. So what I saw was uh, the convergence of the different police officers, um, I guess a pincer operation, if, to use the terminology, and then they, the next minute they were escorting him out with his uh, hands behind his, his back in uh, handcuffs. His arrest comes soon after the 25th anniversary of the murdered teenager Stephen Lawrence. He was attacked by five men at a bus stop in south-east London in a racially motivated killing. This was a court in 1998 spitting at protesters as he left the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. He always denied any involvement in the stabbing and was never charged. A court was held as part of a joint effort by authorities in the UK and Spain. This was part of a, a long-running campaign called Operation Captura which has now been going on for 12 years and in that time we've named 96 uh, fugitives that we've been looking for in Spain and we've captured 81 of them and that's a, a joint uh, campaign along with Crime Stoppers and the Spanish authorities. A court is due to appear in court next week for an extradition hearing. James Waterhouse, BBC News. Well, our correspondent Tom Burridge is in Barcelona and earlier he explained what the Spanish authorities have been telling him. We've got hold of some pretty interesting details about the arrest yesterday and the whole police operation to track Jamie Acourt down to this gym. I'm told by a senior Spanish police source uh, that Jamie Acourt was using false names, he had protection and he was moving around Spain, spending time in parts of the country full of tourists. Uh, one witness, man who witnessed the arrest, uh, said that he was told that there were undercover police officers inside the gym working out, watching Mr Acourt before other officers moved in. And I'm told by Spanish police that when the officers went to arrest him, he initially tried to claim that they got the wrong man. Uh, he said, apparently, that he was an Italian tourist. Uh, now, he'll face a bail hearing today. In the coming days, he's expected to appear before Spain's High Court in Madrid, which will decide whether or not to extradite him uh, back to Britain. Spanish and British police have been working for years to track Jamie Acourt down. He could be extradited really quickly, but if he opposes extradition, it could be a matter of weeks. That was Tom Burridge there. Now, Donald Trump has said the UK's strict gun laws have led to a rise in knife crime, adding that a hospital in London was like a war zone because of the number of stabbing victims. The president was defending Americans' right to own guns, which he said were under siege in a speech to the powerful National Rifle Association. Gary O'Donoghue has the report. There he is. There is Donald J. Trump. Travelling to the NRA's convention is becoming an annual pilgrimage for President Trump. Though today, the president remains staunch in his defence of them and their right constitutionally to own a gun. Your Second Amendment rights are under siege, but they will never, ever be under siege as long as I'm your president. But after the shooting of 17 students and teachers at the school in Parkland, Florida on Valentine's Day, the mood has changed, with young people around the country keeping gun control at the forefront of the debate. My daughter has no voice. She was murdered last week. Shortly after that shooting, the president seemed prepared to stand up to the organisation, though little action followed. But there was no such tough talk for the NRA today. The president also suggesting that just having tight gun laws like those in London didn't stop people being killed in other ways. I recently read a story that in London, which has unbelievably tough gun laws, a once very prestigious hospital right in the middle is like a war zone for horrible stabbing wounds. Yes, that's right. 
They don't they have, have guns. guns. They have, they have knives. knives. This was an uncompromising speech by the president, and in a year where there are congressional elections, there's unlikely to be any more compromised by Republicans. Gary O'Donoghue, BBC News, Dallas. A 17-year-old boy is being questioned by police after a woman was attacked with an electric drill in Straban in Northern Ireland. The 38-year-old victim suffered a very serious head injury and is in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Police are appealing for witnesses to the incident, which happened in the early hours of this morning. Police are investigating after a one-year-old boy was found dead in a flat in Fife. Emergency services were called to a block of flats in Dunfermline on Wednesday where the young child's body was discovered. Police are treating the incident as unexplained. Now, there have been a series of earthquakes in Hawaii, including the most powerful tremor to hit the state in over 40 years. The epicentre was beneath the erupting volcano Mount Kilauea. The 6.9 magnitude quake sent people fleeing from buildings and homes and briefly cut power supplies. Residents are taking shelter from ash, toxic gas and lava flows. Charlotte Gallagher reports. A ribbon of thick lava snakes through the suburban streets and forests, the molten liquid destroying anything in its path. Lava has been surging across the island since Thursday, sometimes shooting up to 100 feet in the air. It was really smoking bad. You could smell it in the air. We're going to get cut off, I think, is what's going to happen. Residents rushed to flee their homes, grabbing what they could. It broke out right down the hill from our house. I smelt it and I ran to the corner and that's when I ran into a military officer that told me that it's smoking and I sure as heck enough, you know, take the turn and my entire, one of my favorite streets at least, <laughs> is on fire. 1,700 people have been ordered to evacuate. Those who refuse have been warned no one will rescue them because of the toxic smoke suffocating the area. These deep cracks have appeared on roads and streets. Residents say it felt like a giant snake was moving under their houses. You could feel the heat coming from the ground. Yeah, there's, there's heat coming up out of this. There's lava under there. This is where the lava is coming from, the Kilauea volcano. Normally, tourists can go right up to the rim. Today, it's only safe viewed from the air. Much of the landscape is now scorched earth, with homes, businesses and forests destroyed. Charlotte Gallagher, BBC News. Well, earlier I spoke to Dr. Dougal Jerram, an earth scientist from the University of Oslo and the one shows Dr. Volcano, and he told me how worried residents on Hawaii should be. Yes, this is a fascinating eruption. It, it, it's occurred in the middle of a, of a housing estate, effectively, um, erupting through the roads, uh, magma shooting up 30 metres into the sky. Um, but the, the eruption itself was, was preceded by a number of earthquakes, about 600 in total, that were a record of the magma moving its way up through the crust, which eventually erupted at the surface. Is uh, Kilauea the, the type of volcano that will blow? Uh, I'm thinking about the pyroclastic um, eruption that we normally associate with volcanoes. Not normally. Um, Kilauea, uh, very much like Iceland, is associated more, more with sort of runny lava flows. In fact, the Pu'uoho eruption has been going for some 35 years, and that I'm sure many viewers have seen uh, oceans of, of, of lava dripping into the sea. Um, it, it, it's really a case of the dangers are really to do with um, the, 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 the danger to homes, the, the lava flow engulfing the homes, but also toxic gases. There had been some concern that some of that lava was flowing back underground and um, we spoke to a guide, a volcano guide, who said, you know, what goes down is going to have to come up and there is concern that those vents could collapse. What does that then mean? Yes, I mean, the 1,700 or so people that have been evacuated have been evacuated for good reason. Um, the magma is clearly close to the surface. The cracks that are appearing in the road are accommodating some stresses close to the surface where the magma is pushing up. Now, clearly, it's erupted through some vents. Sometimes it subsides and things can collapse. And so the danger not only of the lava flows themselves, but also the land collapsing around is a real and, and present threat. So what exactly are the USGS watching for now? Well, one of the indications that you can get from these uh, volcanic 
eruptions is their movements underground. So looking at the, the seismic tremors, I mean, your report indicated the 6.9 magnitude earthquake. That's a really big earthquake. And it tells you that something big is happening underground at this location. Obviously, um, the activity that we're seeing with uh, Kilauea is bad for humans, but ultimately that is why Hawaii is where it is. Exactly. I mean, Hawaii is a volcano that's above what's known as a hot spot or plume. Now, if you imagine a big Bunsen burner under the Pacific Plate, and as the Pacific Plate moves slowly over it, you get these islands popping up. And the big island is currently where that hot spot is, is, is heating the ground beneath and causing volcanoes at the Earth's surface. So the very islands themselves owe their existence to the volcanoes. Uh, you mentioned some of those dangers. You've, you've got the lava flow, um, the, the sulfur as well. It's, it's unpleasant, but the risk, I suppose, is sulfur for dioxide and then the, the dust as well. What other dangers are there? Exactly. I mean, people have reported um, seeing gases coming out of the cracks in the road as they started. Sulfur dioxide is, is a toxic gas that can come from such eruptions. In fact, I, I hear that some roads have been cut off, not because of the danger of the eruptions themselves, but because of, of the gas drifting over them. Um, but also, it's a wooded area, so you get burning trees. Um, basically, the air quality can be a real problem around such eruptions. Uh, very quickly, Dr. Volcano, how long is this going to last? Well, in 1955, a similar eruption lasted for three months, so it could be quite some time. That was uh, Dr. Dougal Jaram there. Now, police in Paris are deploying in large numbers for mass protests called ahead of the anniversary of President Emmanuel Macron's inauguration. Authorities are hoping to avoid a repeat of the violence and damage that scarred May Day protests in Paris earlier this week. OK, so let's talk to our correspondent in Paris, Hugh Schofield. Um, why has he upset the protesters, Hugh? Because they believe that he is enacting reforms which favour exclusively the better off end of society. That is the long and short of it. He, he is, as we know, pursuing policies which are looked on broadly favourably by the rest of the world. They, they look on and see France changing and uh, adopting some of the more pro-market ideas which have become current elsewhere, uh, loosening up the labour code, uh, changing the railway system so that uh, 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 the railway workers don't have jobs for, for life, uh, changing the university system so there's, there is an element of selection, all things which may be uncontroversial in other countries in Europe and around the world, but which here... Uh, do um, trigger a backlash among people who are, uh, and there's a large number of them in France, who are wedded, who are, you know, value the ideas of the left. Uh, they believe that um, Emmanuel Macron is someone who is in awe of money and finance uh, and the, you know, the kind of globalised liberalism which they abhor. And, and that is why they're on the streets today. They represent, uh, you know, a sizable part of, the, of opinion in France, but whether they're big enough to really make a difference and put him off his changes is, is rather more doubtful, I would say. OK. Hugh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Now, the Russian opposition politician Alexei Navalny has been detained after leading what he says are nationwide protests against Vladimir Putin's re-election as president. Mr Navalny, who was banned from running against Mr Putin after being convicted of corruption, has accused the president of behaving like a craven old man who thinks he's a Tsar or Emperor. Russian police are reported to have made several arrests. In fact, we're just learning over a thousand people have been arrested. Uh, this coming to us via the Reuters news agency. Um, Putin protesters uh, have been cleared by the police or in the process of being cleared from Moscow's uh, Pushkinskaya Square. The time is a quarter past three. Your headlines here on BBC News. Jamie Acourt, one of the original suspects in the murder of Stephen Lawrence, is arrested in Spain on drugs charges. He'll appear before a judge today. Donald Trump criticises the level of knife crime in London, comparing one of the capital's hospitals to a war zone. An erupting volcano in Hawaii triggers earthquakes, including the most powerful tremor to hit the state since 1975. And in sports, Stoke City's 10-year spell in the Premier League has come to an end. They've been relegated after a 2-1 defeat at home to Crystal Palace. Dundee have all but secured their place in the Scottish Premiership after a 1-0 win against Hamilton Academical at Dens Park. And it's getting tight in the World Snooker Championship semi-final between John Higgins and Kyron Wilson. I'll be back with an update on that and the rest of the day's sports stories at half past five. See you then.
The official news agency said the country was moving its clocks forward by 30 minutes, bringing it into line with its southern neighbour. President Trump and the South Korean President Moon Jae-in are to hold talks at the White House later, later on this month to prepare for a meeting between Mr. Trump and the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The summit is expected to take place in either late May or June. Uh, President Trump has said that a time and a place for the summit have been set, but details haven't yet been released. Well, our correspondent Stephen McDonnell is in Seoul, and he explained the significance behind the development. Well, look, it sounds like it's kind of nothing. The North Koreans have changed their clocks, they've wound them forward by half an hour to bring that country in line with their southern neighbours. But it is quite significant because you can imagine the administration of Kim Jong-un they have to explain to all North Koreans why they're doing this. Now, if this is a goodwill gesture towards the South, that's expressing to everybody in North Korea this goodwill. The, it's interesting because the, the times in North and South Korea were previously aligned and North Korea changed it because it, it was seen then as a symbolic shift because the time that we have here now was put in place by the Japanese when they occupied the Korean Peninsula. You know, this is the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and symbolically, Pyongyang decided to change the time. And so now it's symbolically had to change it back again. So while it sounds like nothing, it actually is quite something. And it, uh, it's interestingly one way that we know that everybody in North Korea knows something is going on right now in terms of relations between North and South Korea, two countries which are technically still at war. Stephen McDonnell there. Jeremy Corbyn says the local election results leave Labour well placed to win the general, the next general election. The party won control of several councils and had their best results in the capital since 1971. The party did, however, fail to capture several key targets from the Conservatives. The party's former spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, has criticised the leadership and said Labour should be destroying the Tory party. We're kidding ourselves if we think these election results uh, are good. And, you know, I think what I've been arguing for today is not living in denial of real questions that the public are asking, real problems that they want Labour to address, but face up to them. So it's not to undermine Jeremy Corbyn to say that out there in the real world, people are asking the question whether he can be Prime Minister. They're asking whether the Shadow Cabinet is a team. They're asking whether we are doing the right thing on Brexit. They're asking whether we do have the right positions on foreign policy, whether we are taking anti-Semitism seriously and dealing with it. These are real questions. So, and I think that, you know, there's, if you look at the way that the Tories are handling Brexit, where it's all kind of wishful thinking, I think there's an element to parts of the Labour Party just thinking, if we all just sort of stop talking and stop debating, we're all going to waltz into power. It doesn't work like that. That was uh, Alistair Campbell there. Well, with me is Michael Segaloff, a journalist and Labour Party member. Um, so, Alistair Campbell, you heard what he said, is not happy... You, I was looking at your Twitter feed, and you find the whole discussion boring. There's a big yawn. Yeah, I think it's quite tedious that we're still going around in circles talking about the leadership when, when there's been a clear signal and a clear steer from the Labour Party membership over the last, what, two, three years that Jeremy Corbyn is the leader. The direction of the Labour Party is now set. And actually, this was a good result for the Labour Party. It may not have been the gains that some people were predicting, and I think there needs to be a look as to why. But actually, you know, last year we were told in the 2017 general election the Labour had had a successful fluke, that we'd never see that sort of result again. And this year, the Labour Party have built on those results, increasing their vote share. Which, and that, that's impressive and should be celebrated. And in terms of the local results, there were some really impressive gains in places like Plymouth. Uh, and in London, whilst we didn't necessarily take some places, you know, uh, Kensington and Chelsea, um, Wandsworth, Westminster, uh, actually the, the results were pretty good for the Labour Party in these Tory strongholds. In Wandsworth, I think under 100 votes would have swung the council from one to another. In Westminster, whilst the number of councillors differs, it's only 1% difference in vote share between Labour and Conservative. And they are important gains for the Labour Party. Is it doing enough, though? Because, you know, there have been an increase in the voices saying we should have been way ahead, that, you know, more should have been done. Are you happy with the direction of the Labour Party? Well, personally speaking, I think that what we saw in the last general election, again, our last key marker, was, was some really exciting policies in terms of national ideas, nationalisation, tuition fees, the NHS, things that really got people engaged in, in politics who maybe weren't before. And local elections, I think we fail to do that. And I don't mean the Labour Party, I mean all parties. It feels stale, it feels old. For young people, certainly, or a younger person, I haven't got, really got roots anywhere. Uh, the issues that maybe are seen as 
bread and butter of local elections aren't there. I think what the Labour Party can be doing and needs to do moving forward is to find ways to reinvigorate and kind of radically shake up the way we do local politics. And I think that's the key for making sure those people who came out last year will come out again for the Labour Party in future. So is Jeremy Corbyn the man to do that? Well, listen, there's been enough leadership elections <laughs> to show that that clearly is the will of, uh, of the Labour Party. But I, I think it's, again, also tiring that we're continuously discussing him as a leader. The Labour Party right now isn't about individuals or about the, the kind of the leadership. W what's exciting is that we had people knocking on doors all over the country, people coming out who hadn't campaigned before to get people talking about the issues that mattered to them. Despite what's being said by some people in the press, momentum managed to galvanise people in seats up and down the country, people who hadn't necessarily gone on the, on the ground before to try and get people talking. And I think that's what's exciting here. Um, very quickly and finally, mm. a lot of the young vote went to the Tories. Obviously it was the, the UKIP vote. And there has been comment made that Labour aren't going for their, their, their target uh, fan base, if you want to call it that. How, how are they going to do that? Well, I, I, think it's, I think it's hard. I think that the Brexit negotiations are ongoing. And I think for Labour to really galvanise on ex-UKIP voters is going to be tricky. Saying that, where Labour campaigned hard, despite the fact that Tories took a wider proportion of UKIP voters, in places like, like Portsmouth and Plymouth, for instance, where there were UKIP votes, they did go to Labour, where they were visible on the ground. But again, in terms of getting people engaged in the Labour Party and engaged in those policies, it's about finding ways to reinvigorate local politics. And, and that hasn't sadly happened. OK. Michael Sagaloff, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, now, a record crowd of over 40,000 is expected at Wembley over the next few hours, and that's ahead of the Women's FA Cup final. It's a London derby.